idea of what you can expect in today's service. In just a moment, the band is going to lead us in a time of worship together. We hope you experience the presence of Christ during this time. We encourage you to sing along with us. After worship, I'll be back to get you up to speed with some next steps you can take to get more engaged here at Eastern Hills. Then we'll hear a message that's both helpful and hopeful. If you're on site, please let our team members know if we can serve you in any way this morning. And if you're joining us online, we hope you'll be joining us in the chat. We've got a great service planned. Let's get started. Good morning, everybody. Come on, would you stand together? Come on, we're going to worship God. Come on, put your hands together. Hey. Can we see this? Our good herald angels sing glory to the newborn King. Peace on earth and mercy mild. God and sinners reconciled. Joyful all ye nations rise. Join the triumph of the sky. With angelic hosts proclaim Christ is born in Bethlehem. Hark the herald angels sing glory to the new Born King. Yeah. We sing Hail the Heaven Born Prince. Hail the Heaven Born Prince of Peace. Hail the Son of Righteousness. Light and light to all He brings. Risen with healing in His wings. Mighty.
I turn to heaven and spoke your name into the night. Then through the darkness, your loving kindness tore through the shadow of my soul. The work is finished, the end is written. Jesus Christ, my living Lord. Who could imagine so great a mercy? What I could fathom such boundless grace. The God of ages stepped down from glory. To wear my sin and bear my shame The cross I spoke I am forgiven The King of Kings calls me His own Beautiful Savior, I'm yours forever Jesus Christ my living Lord. Sing hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah. Death has lost its grip on me. You have broken every chain. This salvation in your name. Jesus Christ. My living
You know, hope is a word that we often use. You know, I hope it works out okay, or I hope things change. It's this time of year where we discuss hope from a, from a biblical standpoint, and we talk about hope during Christmas. But as followers of Jesus, our hope is built on an event. It's the fulfillment of a promise, the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. And as we just sung, we worship a living hope, but there's always a temptation to place our hope in someone or something other than Jesus. And Paul wrote to a young up and coming leader with some specific instructions as it related to hope and a temptation that is very much a reality for us all. And he said this, he said, command those who are rich in the present world not to be arrogant nor put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. And then he says, command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous and willing to share. In this way, they will lay their treasure for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age so that they may take hold of the life that is truly life. So when we give, we're giving generously and we're partnering with God and saying, I'm, I'm not gonna put my hope in the things of this world. I'm putting my hope in the things that are eternal. Relationship with Christ is something that's eternal. And so as we receive today's offering, when you give to the ministry of Eastern Hills, some of those resources are used to come alongside our strategic partners, which we'll talk about later in our service today. And they're present in our lobby and we're glad to have them here with us today. But it's so that we're making a difference here beyond what takes place in our services on Sunday. So let's pray for God to continue to do that this morning. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for all that you so generously provide. Lord, I, I know if I'm honest, that temptation is always there to place my hope in something or someone other than you. And if I'm honest, there are times where I've done that, where it's just fleeting, it's not fulfilling, but I can look at those moments of my life where I've leaned on you and I've experienced the hope that comes from your son Christ. Something that is eternal. So Lord, this morning, would you help us to do exactly that? And as we give generously, Lord, would you use the resources that you've provided to make a difference here in central New York so that more and more people might become fully engaged in Christ at church and on mission. And we pray these things in the power of your son, Christ Jesus' name, amen. Let's continue in worship.
just pray with me. God, we are here in your presence, Lord, and we just thank you for the opportunity to meet here with you this morning and celebrate the fact that you are all three in one, God, and you are here for us and you are on our team every time we put our hope in you and we put our trust in you always. And it's in Jesus' name that I pray, amen. Well, it is so good to see all of you here in church today. So many lovely faces. If you could just go ahead and turn to a neighbor next to you and wish them a happy December, the Christmas month. Go for it. and welcome to all of you joining us on site and online. Again, my name is Kristen and I get to serve on staff here at Eastern Hills. And I'm so glad that you've decided to spend your morning with us. If you're joining us for the first time, we're so glad that you're here. We aspire to be the type of church where we do everything with the guest in mind. If there's anything we can do to serve you or your family today, please let us know. As a church, we're here to help people become fully engaged in Christ at church and on mission. In order to do that, we wanna help you take next steps along your journey with Christ. A great way to do that is by dedicating your children back to Him. As a church, we are called to walk alongside of parents in an effort to strengthen and encourage their commitment to raise their children in a way that points to Christ. We will be holding parent-child dedications in our Christmas Eve services on Saturday, December 24th. If you're interested in dedicating your children to Christ, you can contact me at kristen.cuthbert at easternhills.org. We are so excited to be hosting Christmas Eve services this year on Saturday, December 24th at 2 and 4 p.m. as we gather to celebrate Christ the King. There will be no children's ministry as we hope for you to enjoy the service as a family. If you cannot join us on site, the 2 o'clock service will be live broadcasted. 
Additionally, in an effort to thank our volunteers and give everyone a time of respite with their families, we will not have services on Sunday, December 25th or January 1st. Stay tuned for a special online experience on Sunday, January 1st. For those on site today, if you're interested in taking a next step towards becoming more engaged at Eastern Hills, fill out the connection card right in front of you. We encourage you to stop by the Connection Center to the left as you exit the auditorium. One of our team members would love to meet with you. Another great way to take a next step is to scan the QR code and fill out our connection card that way. No paper necessary. For those joining us online, we hope you'll reach out to us in the chat this morning so we can help you take a next step towards becoming more engaged. Today we'll be hearing a sermon from Rob. Let's get started. All right, well, good morning. And Merry Christmas. Yeah, it's okay to start saying that. Hey, so if this is your first Sunday here with us today and I've not got a chance to meet you before, I have the privilege privilege of serving as one of the pastors here at Eastern Hills. And then after service today to the Connection Center, the Connection Center to your left is where I'll be hanging out. So if you have questions about the church or the sermon this morning, or maybe you're going through something and you just like to pray, I'll be over there. Come say hello um, after we're done. But uh, today's kind of a bridge message for the past three weeks. We've talked about generosity, and so you can check those messages out online. And next week we're kicking off a a Christmas series. And so this is kind of the in-between of where we've been and where we're going. Um, But nonetheless, I think you're going to find it both helpful and hopeful. But I'm going to pray, and then we'll get started. Lord, um, I ask this morning that you would help my words uh, to be clear so that you would be glorified as we open up your word and truth. We do believe that it's alive, it's living, and it's active, and that it does have the power to transform our lives today. So we pray that that would happen. And we pray these things in your son Christ's name. Amen. Hey, so I'm going to ask you to use your imagination as we get started this morning. Imagine it's Christmas Day, and it's one of those Hall of Fame type of Christmas mornings. So it snowed, and it's the perfect kind of snow. It's blanketed the surroundings. It's hit the tree. It's hit the yard. You know, it's sunny in December in Syracuse, which is awesome, and and that's a win, and it's not so warm that the snow's melting, but it's not so cold. It's like the perfect temperature outside, and your attendance is 100%. Everybody that you want there on that Christmas, they're there, so you're excited about that. People are, are laughing. People are having a good time. Hope is being sung on the radio. The meal is perfectly lined up. You've made it through the the Christmas uh, gift exchange and everybody's happy. There's, There's generosity that's taking place. And then all of a sudden you hear a knock on the door. And you look through the peephole and there's an ominous figure a guest that you do not want to invite in to your Christmas. And it doesn't matter how much you try to ignore it, it will not go away. And it's not, you know, Cousin Eddie, who didn't want at Christmas. <clears throat> and sorry if your name is Eddie. I just had to pick a name, nothing personal. And it's not the miraculous Amazon uh, gift package that just went out above and beyond to make sure that your Christmas was so special. No, this is, a gift, a gift. this is a guest that you do not want in your Christmas. And this guest is persistent. You see, my hope today is to help us see that loneliness is an unwanted, wanted guest at Christmas. You see, being alone and lonely are not the same thing. Loneliness is so much more than just your physical reality. Loneliness is connected to your hopes, your desires, the conflict in your life, the relationships in your life. You see, it's pretty amazing. You can be in a room full of hundreds of people and feel lonely. And at the same time, you can be in a room with some of your closest friends and family members, a handful of them, and still feel lonely. Lonely. You see, to be lonely is to not be fully known. And when I say fully known, I mean the things that are going on in your life that maybe you're you're ashamed about, you're embarrassed about, or maybe even the anxiety that you feel, the depression that you feel, the things that you do not want to open up about because if you share with other people, they might not no no longer want to know who you are. 
And any time you're not fully known, it's impossible to be fully loved. And to not be fully known and to not be fully loved is incredibly lonely. And loneliness is an unwanted guest at Christmas. And yet, what we'll see today, it's also a wanted guest of Christmas. So if you have have your Bible this morning, we're going to jump around a little bit. But there are three sections of Scripture we're going to look at found in the Gospels. The Gospel of Luke, the Gospel of Matthew, and the Gospel of John. And if you missed last week, Chad did a great job, and we learned some things about Chad. Chad's a new pastor on staff. But I've learned that we both, this is interesting, we both have a freckle on our left toe. Interesting coincidence. I'm also discovering that Chad is a man of many nicknames. I found out Chabby is one of them. Not sure how I feel about that one. I did like the first time he was here when he interviewed the whole tall drink of water one. Uh, That one, a lot more interesting. But the thing about nicknames is that you're not allowed to give yourself your own nickname. So as a church, we'll have to figure out what his final and permanent nickname will be. But one of the things that Chad talked about was the importance of biblical context. And we're in agreement in that. In fact, it's the answer to an important question as you study the story of Christmas in the Gospels. Here's the question. How is the Christmas story different and yet the same in the Gospels? Is there a contradiction? Why is it that I read through one section and it seems like there's different perspective and different details as I go along each book? Well, the answer can be found. It's, it's similar that if you ever watch a, a food show on the Food Network, and you, you, you know, they just rip these dishes to, thread, uh, to threads, and each uh, cook or chef has a unique perspective. And they could have the same dish and give an entirely different evaluation. Well, why is that? Maybe the particular dish that they're eating is a cuisine that they're an expert in, or that dish connects with a moment of their their childhood or unique experience, and so their perspective on the dish might be different than others, even though they're eating the same meal. Same could be said about why critics can watch a movie and a film and have two different perspectives on what they just saw based on the genre of the film, or the, the actors are involved. Or if you watch a sporting event, if the radio broadcaster for the home team is watching the game, it's going to sound one way. In the same way, if you watch the radio broadcaster for the away team, it's going to sound like they're watching a completely different ball game. Well, the same is said about the gospel writers. They have a unique perspective in their writings. They understand the audience that they're writing to. The different details that they're drawn to is based on their unique perspective. And so that these stories that are found in the Christmas Gospels, they're not in contradiction of one another. Actually, they complement one another. And it's the Holy Spirit that provides the continuity. But to understand the whole story, we need to put all of them together. And so today's kind of a primer of where we're going in the weeks ahead. But we're going to start with the Gospel of Luke, uh, chapter 1, verses 26 through 33. Now, what's important to understand about Luke is, well, if Luke was alive today, he'd probably be a podcaster. If you listen to podcasts, people listen to, to interviews, people unpack different stories or things that they've gone through. And so here's Luke. Luke says, listen, I've spent time with Peter. And I've spent time with Mary. I mean, if you wanted to get the inside scoop on that first Christmas, why not talk with the person that actually experienced it that way? So Luke's Christmas account is less like a once upon a time type of story. And Luke's Christmas account, it's more of a historical event. Luke wrote with the perspective of historical documentation. And so he writes, in the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth a town in Galilee, to a virgin, this is important, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. And Mary's response, Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. Now, at this point, this is new information to Mary, and she's processing through the lens of her context. Because in Jewish society, the whole process of the engagement was over the course of a year's time. And part of this process was negotiation between families, coming to terms of an agreement. Part of that was financial. And after they would settle on an agreement, 
the, the groom would leave and go back likely to his father's house and he would begin to build out a room. So if you like HGV, I was thinking this week, that would be some type of HGV show, right? You're going to go back to your house. You're going to build a home where you're going to bring your future bride to. So, and this time, it's okay to still live at home with mom and dad. But along this journey, someplace within this year, there would also be a wedding feast. And so this is where they're at at some point in the engagement process. And here's the deal. You could not play house at this point in history. You, you could not pretend to be married and live together. In fact, it was important that if you were to be together, you would always have a chaperone because to spend time alone together apart from the chaperone, people would start to assume the worst, adultery. And so here's Mary playing it forward saying, people are going to fill in the gaps with the absolute worst. So who is Mary to talk to about this? Who is Mary to go to to say, I need encouragement. Who is Mary to have those type of conversations that you process with when you're uncertain of what's going to happen next? Mary is alone. And so isn't it true that when it comes to loneliness, it's lonely to be uncertain of what's next? Uh, I had a friend uh, take me to a Patriots game this week. It was awesome. Over in Foxborough, Gillette, Stadium, it was great. And uh, this friend, what I enjoy about this friend is he set up the evening perfectly. So I knew exactly what we were gonna do and we're gonna have dinner together and who we were gonna have dinner with and where we were gonna park. And there was this whole elaborate uh, scheme that was gonna take place and that we would park in someone's yard. So we would park in someone's front yard. There's like 20 cars and only a select amount of people could park in the yard and you'd roll down the window and you kind of had to be on the inside to park in this person's yard. And then you would get out of the car and you would go through the woods and then you would go through the uh, car, uh, car dealership across from Gillette Stadium to kind of to avoid some of the craziness in the parking lot. So I'm fully prepared. I'm enjoying the evening. We get into the stadium and then we start to make our way to our seats up at the top. And so what I was not prepared for were the stairs. Now it's cold, so I'm layered up. I got a hoodie, I've got my sweatshirt, I've got my parka coat on, and there's one set of stairs, and a second set of stairs, and a third set. Oh, and by the way, at dinner I found out both these guys run marathons. So the stair, it's, it's not a concern for them at this point. And I'm watching the two, they're skipping stairs, and I'm counting the stairs, and, and I'm starting to get a little dizzy, and I'm hot, and I don't know how many more stairs that's going to be. That was an incredibly lonely place to be, uncertain of just how long this is going to take. I survived, and I didn't pass out. It was great. But have you been there before? Probably on a more serious level, I remember going and visiting my grandmother when she was sick. And it was the type of conversation where she could either get better or it was going to be a final conversation. And I remember driving six and a half hours home, uncertain if that was the last time I would ever have a conversation with my grandmother. It's a lonely place to be. My mom already passed away, never met my biological grandfather. My uncle on my mom's side, all death, 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 and thinking, here's another one. That's the lonely place to be. And that's where Mary found herself, and that's where some of us find ourselves even in this season. Maybe there's things that you're going through, and you're uncertain of what's going to happen next. That's Mary's story, and that's also Joseph's story. And Matthew gives us a little bit more context about Joseph's perspective. Now, Matthew's a tax collector. He's an encounter, uh, accountant. And so this is important to understand, especially if you're the type of person that's a skeptic when it comes to the scriptures, like, can I really believe that it happened the way that it happened? Well, with Matthew, he's a tax collector, which means he had a skill of shorthand, which meant that he was skilled in writing a lot of things down in a quick amount of time. So when you think about the Sermon on the Mount, could someone really listen to all that Jesus said, all three chapters? Did he get every single word? yes because that's what he did by trade, that's what he did by profession. And so Matthew's gospel is orderly and it's concise and it's laid out over six discussions. But he writes about the Christmas account and he says this, this is how the birth of Jesus the Messiah came about. 
his mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph. But before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law, and yet he did not want to expose her to public disgrace. He had in mind to divorce her quietly. So you can imagine that in this moment, the whispers were coming to mind for Joseph. The looks that he might get. You know, Joseph understood, hey, I've done everything right by Old Testament standards. I've lived a faithful life. I went about the engagement process the right way. But now in conversations, you know, as he's hanging out with people that he's close, closest with, saying, hey, you know what, God did this to us, was not going to be one that people walk away saying, well, we understand. And so Joseph is left with two different options based on culture during this time. Option one, divorce Mary publicly. Stoning was not something that they did at this point in the first century. But option one would be to put all of the shame and dishonor Mary publicly. Option two, Joseph's choice would be to take all of the shame upon himself. And this is a big deal because in this culture, honor was everything. To be full of shame in this culture would be worse than death. So this is a significant choice. For Joseph, And then God shows up. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. A few verses later, when Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him and took Mary home as his wife. So in the end, he was faithful and chose to trust God, but still was left with the reality of the shame that he would face. Have you been there before where you feel like, God, I've done everything right. I, got, I, I had the path and I was faithful and I made this choice and I honored you this way and, and everything was lined up and I was heading down this path and, and now everything's changed. Why does it have to be this way? And by the way, as far as angels communicating to us and having a unique conversation, this is rare and remarkable. So if you're at a season in your life and you are uncertain of what next and you're asking for God to speak to you in a divine way, I would say start with the 66 books that he's already spoken. God had plenty to say and he wrote it down for us to process and pray through and think through. Nonetheless, Joseph's showing up and saying, listen, guys, you got to understand, my wife is pregnant with the Savior of the world. They're not, he knows they're not going to receive that graciously. You see, isn't it true that when it comes to loneliness, it's lonely to be misunderstood? Humans are wildly creative. Do you guys remember playing the telephone game when you were younger? Isn't it fascinating how you can uh, start on one end and, you know, the sky is blue and then uh, by the end it's, you know, the, the person chewing is a fool and you're like, how did you get from here to here? Well, as adults, we experience that game differently, right? When there's a gap in relationships, we fill it in with our imagination, and now we have social media, so we can take to social media and we can voice our opinions, whether they're true or not. And gossip and slander, all of that can settle in. And then you might find, or maybe you found yourself in this situation before, have you ever walked into a room or a grocery store, and with one look, someone looks at you, and you know that they think that they know, but they don't really know because they've created a narrative in their mind. That's the reality for Mary and Joseph. And that's an incredibly lonely place to be. Loneliness is an unwanted guest at Christmas, and yet what we're about to see is that it's a wanted guest of Christmas. If you're here this morning and you're on the fence when it comes to Jesus, here's a question I would ask you. What was so special about Jesus if he isn't who he said he was. 
Cyrus the Great reigned uh, 539 to 530 BC. King Henry VIII reigned 1509 to 1547. Genghis Khan, 1206 to 1227. If you were to do a quick Google search, most powerful kings in history, these are names that would come up. Let me ask you this. Do you celebrate their birthday? I don't. Maybe you have a unique Christmas tradition. Jesus' ministry, roughly about three and a half years, still celebrating his birth. In fact, people have died so that we would continue to celebrate his birth and his resurrection. Now, Matthew does a great job, and, and so does Luke when it comes to the details of Christmas, but John summarizes the entire story of Christmas and the arrival of Christ, John gives us the why of Christmas. Here's what he says. The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision, or a husband's will, but born of God. So it was not enough to be born a Jew, or to be born into a royal family, or to be born into the right community, or to be born into the right tribe. There had to be a spiritual rebirth that could only be experienced through Christ. And that could only happen through the loneliness of what takes place on the cross. You see, the message of Christmas is this, that Christ entered into the loneliness of humanity, light into darkness. And on the cross, Christ embraced loneliness on your behalf and my behalf, taking on the sin and the weight of the world so that humanity might never again be alone. And in this, this is the only way that you and I would ever be fully known. All of your thoughts, all of your anxieties, all of your fears, all of your sin, all of the baggage, all of the things that you don't want other people to know about you, he knows, and yet he says, you are fully loved. Loved through grace, loved through mercy, loved through truth. There's nothing that you could do or not do to make him love you any more or any less. Your resume is, does not earn his love. It is freely given to you. Fully known, fully loved, and only in that way will we never, ever be alone again. Because the message of Christmas is this. God has came, Emmanuel, God is with us. In Christ, we are fully known, fully loved, and never alone. And it's not just this time of year, and it's not just this lifetime, but this is a relationship that is eternal. And so how do we respond to this unwanted, wanted yes that comes around this time of year? Well, we enter into the loneliness of others. I was reading this week that loneliness and what we experience because of it has the effect on the human body that 15 cigarettes smoked in one day has. It's incredible. The mental impact, the physical impact, and the spiritual impact. And the only way to combat that in a way that is supernatural is through the gospel and the message of Christmas, Christ came to be known so that you would know him and never again be alone. So this morning, there are two things I'd like us to do. The first one is an invitation, and the second one is a question. The invitation this morning is this. Would you be willing to spend some time with our strategic partners in the lobby today after service? And here's what's interesting about every single one of our strategic partners. I thought about this week. Every single one of them, in their way, enter into the loneliness of humanity. Through David's Refuge, it's an opportunity to help those families with special needs. 
and those that are along that journey be seen and loved. Through the message, the ministry and the organization of Hope Print, refugees that are here, disconnected, finding connection, alone, trying to figure out and navigate life to enter into their state of loneliness. Pastor Rock and serving those students to say that there is a different path, that there is hope, that there is a different way to move forward in life, that you are seen, your life has value, your life has purpose. And then Young Life and Campus Crusade, that ultimately what we crave is to be fully known and fully loved and to experience that through Christ and their ministries. And then young lives. Think about it. It's this time of year where we think about a young, pregnant mom. Who would she talk to? Who would she turn to? Who would encourage her? Who would support her? Is that not what we're talking about this time of year? And young lives is a ministry that says, enter into their loneliness and to come alongside them. And so this morning, I want you to hear some of the stories. Last week, we, we watched a video and some of the stories were shared. And, and this week, we're going to watch the second part of that video in terms of the impact that they're making here in central New York. So I'm Rebecca Stover, and I'm the Young Lives Coordinator for Syracuse City. My name is John Yelverton, and this is my wife, Bonnie. We work with Crew. Hey, guys, I'm, I'm Nate Pena. I'm the director of Pastor Rock, a local nonprofit here in Syracuse. The core mission of Young Lives is to reach lost kids for Christ. We work with teen moms and their babies, and we just um, show them a lot of love and teach them that Jesus loves them, too. So we come alongside of students during their time in college. Some of them are curious and searching to know God. God, others are already believers, and our goal is to help them grow into mature disciples. And so we do that through hosting Bible studies, having a weekly meeting with worship and teaching. We have service opportunities where we serve, like in a food bank in the local community. All kinds of different ways for students to really grow and develop in their faith throughout college. So Pastor Rock is a youth empowerment and mentoring program. We want to redefine the realities of inner city youth from desperation to hope. So Young Lives will um, help, like if a mom's struggling and she needs diapers for her baby or ha she's having an emergency where she doesn't have um, a lot of food, we'll um, bring groceries. On Mother's Day, we like brought them flowers. Valentine's Day, we brought them chocolate. Like we just, um, just try to show them that they're loved and cared about. There's so many stories of moms that have um, come back, like there's one girl that's staying right now with one of our mentors that um, has come back and now she's like a CNA and a traveling CNA and she was in Young Lives like five years ago and now she has a couple more children and she's just, um, you know, so a lot of the moms have come back and shared how Young Lives has changed their lives or um, helped them just mature and grow in, in their relationship with God. We met Anthony and Amanda during their freshman year. Anthony is a year ahead of Amanda. Um, and I still remember sitting down with Anthony in the dining hall at BBB on campus and going through the gospel with him, which is something that we like to do with freshmen when they join our ministries. During his time at Syracuse, he was a student at the Whitman School of Management, the business school. And he really grabbed hold of this idea of, I know the Lord and it's such a valuable, such a treasure for me. I want to share it with others. And so at that point, we were going on campus every week. We were going to campus every week and having a time set aside where we would engage with students. Anthony and Amanda met while we were doing that outreach on campus. They met through crew. And I remember a couple times when it was just me and maybe a few other students and watching them walk off together to go share their faith in the student center at Syracuse and thinking, hmm, I feel like something's going on there. And so now they're married, and Amanda's on staff with Crew. She works with the Inner City Ministry in New York City, and Anthony's an accountant. And they have a heart to glorify the Lord. You know, they would look back and say that college was a real turning point for them, and it was a privilege for us to be a part of it. You know, I've been doing Pastor Rock for 20 years in Syracuse. I have guys who were in my original program when I moved here to now have their sons in the program. One of my guys that I worked with for a long time really didn't know the impact that I was having until, you know, you know, six, seven months into me hanging out with this guy being a mentor, um, I get a phone call uh, in the middle of the night from the hospital. He had been uh, hit in a drive-by. He had called me in, the, in a moment of crisis where he was almost paralyzed, couldn't walk for, you know, for a while. 
near death, but called me just and was like, hey, I, can you please come be with me? You know, be with me and my family. I'm walking out, I remember him saying, you know, hey, I, I love you, Nate. And it was like, very strange, because he's from the hood, I'm from the hood, and that's not something that two dudes do. You know, and I was like, hey, you know, hey, I love you too, man. It was just, just different. And so it was just, I was, it really kind of impacted me as well. Fast forward, you know, 10 years, he is now a uh, one of the board members at the Brady Face Center down in Syracuse. So it's just from a kid who was on the streets to now being a board member at, at a local nonprofit, you know. Eastern Hills, we just want to thank you so much for your partnership with Young Lives. Um, and for all of your support. It's um, because of people like you that we keep um, being able to love moms and babies in our community. Eastern Hills, a big thank you from us for supporting us and praying for us so that we can help students grow into lifelong disciples of Jesus. Hey, Eastern Hills family, I just want to say thank you so much for all the support you've given Pastor Rock over the years. Um, you know, as a former staff member and board member here, I remember being a little scared to kind of jump off the edge and do this full time, but I'm so thankful that I did and with the support of Eastern Hills and making that happen and um, just love being out here in the community serving all these youth. And I just thank you guys. I could not do it without you. I uh, appreciate everything you've done for me. Thanks. Yeah, we can clap and celebrate. Uh, as you leave here today, there's a, a pamphlet, and it just kind of gives an overview of some of the different ministries. And so whether it be through an act of generosity financially, but also maybe an act of generosity of time and saying, hey, how can I be a part of this organization? How can I come alongside others that might be in a state of loneliness, feeling alone, disconnected, isolated, without purpose and without hope? How can I use the relationship I have with Jesus to enter into someone else's brokenness or need? But today, here's what I'd like us to leave with. And this is an important question. Is your relationship with Jesus rooted in acknowledgement or assurance? Now, this question assumes that you have a relationship with Jesus. So maybe you're here today and you're in the camp of saying, I'm not really sure where I'm at with Jesus and I'm not really sure that God exists. And maybe you're in the camp of uh, God is uh, maybe there, maybe not there. Maybe this life is just a cosmic accident. And now my life is really about living life mor morally, just being the best possible person I could be. Or maybe you're in the camp of saying, you know what, I think it's just more about being a good person and that the better person I am, the better chance I have of having a relationship with God. Or maybe you're in a season where you say, you know what, what goes around comes around, that how I live this life will affect my next life. If we were having a conversation over a cup of coffee, I'd probably say to you here, let's consider this. If you're right and I'm off, then I'm gonna be okay. Because as a follower of Jesus, I'm fully convinced that the way I follow after him will lead to a life of joy, peace, and contentment. But if you're off when it comes to that baby in a manger growing to be a man and experiencing his life, death, burial, and resurrection, if you're off, it's not hell that is the biggest point of concern. And yes, hell's a real place. And yes, there is consequences for those that go against God and choose not to follow after him. But what's at stake for you is missing out on being fully known and fully loved. That type of relationship is only found in Christ. But for those of you that have a relationship with Jesus, here's my question for you. Is it rooted in acknowledgement or assurance? Because it's this time of year where we sing Christmas songs. We'll sing Emmanuel, God with us. He's come, he's peace, he's hope, he's joy, he's, he's contentment, he is wisdom. Wisdom is not this set of abstract principles, but it's a person and it's only found in the person of Jesus. We can acknowledge those things or we can live with assurance. Here's the difference. Acknowledgement says something is true. Assurance is confidence in one's abilities. So I can acknowledge that this stage is properly constructed and it will take all of my weight. And I can say that it is true. But it's another thing to have full assurance and to say I am confident in its abilities so that when I jump up and down, it's going to carry my weight. I know what you're thinking. Wow, those are some crazy ups. We need to get him in the basketball rec league this week. No. More times than not, I will say, I believe that God is with me. He is in me and working through me. And I preach that. 
But when I enter into this state of loneliness and I'm uncertain of what's next, and when I enter into a state of loneliness because people misunderstand who I am and what God's doing through me, and you're sitting around conversations that you think they know you, but they don't really know you. Assurance says God knows. Assurance says he's well pleased with me. Assurance says I'm not going to run away from this, I'm going to enter into this. Assurance says I'm putting all of my weight, trust, and confidence that as scary as what's going to come next and I'm not sure what's gonna happen next, I truly believe that he is with me. So when you think about your own personal relationship with Jesus, is it rooted in acknowledgement, things that you just say are true? Or do you have confidence and assurance in the abilities of a resurrected God that is not distant or absent, but that physically dwells within you? Can you imagine the difference in your life in this season as you entered into the brokenness of humanity, if you move forward with assurance that he is risen, the baby in the manger grew up to be a man and lived out to be a living, resurrected God. This week, what does this look like for you? And what areas of your life do you maybe acknowledge the truths of Christianity, but you're living without that assurance? Maybe you have that conversation this week as you drive home from church or in your small group or with people that you love and care about. But here's a step that we can all take. Would you stand to your feet this morning if you're able? Here's a prayer that you might pray. I've been a follower of Jesus for some time, maybe not as long as some of you, but even then sometimes I enter into prayer and I'm not sure what to pray or how to pray. Sometimes the words just don't come out. And so in these moments, what I've found to be helpful is to go to the Psalms and to pray through what was once prayed. And so we're gonna do that. We're gonna look at Psalm 25 this morning, and this is an adaptation from that prayer. And I'm gonna ask you just to, to say these words with confidence and assurance that God hears our prayers and he will respond to our prayers. So let's pray together. In you, Lord God, we put our trust. No one who hopes in you will ever be put to shame. Show us your ways, Lord. Teach us your paths. Guide us in your truth and teach us, for you are God, our Savior, and our hope is in you all day long. Instruct us away from our sinful desires. Turn to us and be gracious to us when we are lonely and afflicted. You have freed us away from the penalty of our sins, relieved the troubles of our hearts, and free us from our anguish. We take refuge in you. Let's pray. Lord, may those words be true for us this week as we take refuge in you. Lord, I pray for that person that came in this morning that might even be thinking about the purpose of their life and whether it's worth living another day in their state of loneliness. Would you send people to show up in their lives? Would you raise up brothers and sisters in Christ to come alongside them and to help them experience an eternal hope that you have not abandoned them, that you have not forsaken them, and that you promise to be with them through your son, Christ Jesus. Help us to be the type of church that enters into the loneliness of others as you once did for us through the cross, Lord. And we pray these things to the power of your son, Christ Jesus' name, amen. Well, Eastern Hills, as you leave here this week, my prayer is for you is that you look for those people that might be in a state of loneliness and that you would enter in and not run away from. Eastern Hills, you are sent. Have a great week. We'll see you back again next Sunday.